OK, we are now officially recording the presentation, so we can begin this second lecture. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to, to begin this, uh, this lecture with uh, uh, a presentation made by, by uh, our dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jenny Bradbury. And uh, just a few words to, to introduce her and first of all, to thank her for, for um, participating in this, this uh, Levant session of the 2023 springtime. And uh, so Jenny is, is a, an assistant professor at Bryn Mawr College in the United States in the Department of Classical and Near Eastern Archaeology. Her research interests range from the US uh, GIS and archaeological survey techniques through to aspects of identity and personhood as seen through the mortuary record. More recently, she has been involved in the projects focusing on the documentation and protection of cultural heritage in the Yamina region. Uh, Jenny's PhD from Durham University uh, focused on 4th to 3rd millennia BC uh, in Syria and explored settlement and activity in hitherto understudied region to the near uh, mm, to the east of modern homes. Uh, not east, sorry, of modern homes. Following her PhD, she completed a fellowship at the British Institute in Amman before returning to Durham as a postdoctoral researcher on the Invisible Dead project, a project that explored long-term shifts in funerary and mortuary practices in the ancient Near East and Britain from the Neolithic until the Roman period. Prior to moving to Bryn Mawr, she was a teaching fellow at Tübingen and then a senior researcher on the endangered archaeological archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa project at the University of Oxford. Jenny has conducted archaeological fieldwork across the Middle East, in particular in Jordan and Syria, and is now involved in three survey projects in Lebanon, which explore long-term settlement patterns and interconnections between humans and their environment in three very different landscapes, my time, riverine and forested upland. Drawing inspiration from the Invisible Dead, she is also currently working on a book project which attempts to embrace the messiness and variability of the archaeological record in order to explore shifts in the manipulation and treatment of the human body and associated concepts of identity from the Calcolithic through the, to the Iron Age in the Levant. So a super rich CV, I have to say. <laughs> Jenny, my congratulations. <laughs> so much, so much stuff altogether. But I mean, I'm, I'm very happy that you are with us. And so I, I leave immediately the floor uh, to you and thank again for, for joining us in this session. Thank you very much. So thank you, Marco, so much for that um, wonderful introduction. I'm just gonna um, start to share my screen with you all so you can see uh, my presentation. <clears throat> um, and while that's just kind of um, uh, loading and, and kind of getting ready, um, I just wanted to thank Marco again for inviting me today, um, but also um, thank Awa for um, hosting uh, this talk. Um, and before I started, I did just want to mention that I will be showing um, images of human remains in my talk today. Um, most of these will be in the form of published plans um, rather than kind of photographs of um, human remains themselves. But I just want to kind of um, forewarn you um, about that. Um, and as Marco was kind of hinting to, um, as he was kind of uh, describing some of the work I've been involved with, what I really wanted to do today is give you an insight into some of the, the kind of research that I've been involved with uh, over the kind of past few years, um, which highlights the diversity and complexity of burial practices within the ancient Levant. Um, but to start off, we can have a little bit of a think about where it all began. And as a species, we have been concerned with the dead and their post-mortem treatment for the past 100,000 years, if not more. And although death is obviously a, a kind of shared um, human experience, the realities surrounding the death of a community member and the necessity of having to deal with their corpse um, provokes a huge variety of responses. And this can range from the kind of hasty disposal of the deceased uh, through to a kind of elaborate and lengthy um, funerary rituals. Um, and I would argue that despite uh, many projects that have tried to identify a normative uh, burial practice for any given period, in reality, what we encounter in the archaeological record is a dazzling spectrum of ways in which the living can deal with the dead. And this applies both to the ancient world and also the modern world in many cases. <clears throat> 
So some of the um, earliest evidence that we have um, for formalized or deliberate burial of human remains um, is from the sites such as Skull and Kafsa, dating to around 130,000 to 90,000 years ago. And these sites first investigated in the 1930s seem to point towards the deliberate and systematic burial of adults and children, as well as symbolic behaviours alongside um, those burial activities associated with the use of artefacts such as marine shells. We can also think about um, animal depositions um, and also the use of, of ochre. But what I want to do today, rather than kind of taking a very long durée um, perspective, um, is to kind of shine a light on just a, a kind of small fragment of the diversity of burial practices within the late ancient Levant, and to start to show how by kind of delving a little bit deeper and perhaps combining both a, a macro and a, a micro scale approach to understanding uh, the burial record, we can start to um, drill down and identify and think about different ideas around personhood and identity, as well as patterns of similarity and difference in the archaeological record. Um, so before I delve into the kind of main themes, my main topics for today, um, Marco mentioned that I've been involved with a project known as the Invisible Dead Project. And I just want to kind of touch very briefly upon some of the big themes, uh, the big kind of findings that emerge from that, and just give you a little insight into uh, the kind of the legacies and the data that we generated as part of that project. Because my current uh, book project that I'm working on at the moment very much draws um, inspiration from that and kind of uses some of the baseline data that we created as part of that project. Um, so this project, uh, The Invisible Dead, uh, which was based at Durham University, was first initiated in 2012 and was funded by the John Templeton Foundation. And it was uh, directed by Professor Chris Scar, um, who's a British uh, Neolithic um, archaeologist, and co-directed by principal investigators Graham Phillip um, on the Near Eastern side, Charlotte Roberts, who's a, a bioarchaeologist, and Douglas Davis, um, who's a, a theologist. Um, and the, the aims of this project were to collate burial data for the Near East and for Britain, um, as Marco was saying, from the Neolithic um, through to the Roman um, period. Um, and over a period of around two years, we collated data on around 40,000 individuals and nearly 200,000 burial features. And this is just for the, for the kind of Near East. Um, and what this really kind of highlighted is sometimes the, the difficulty of working between these different scales of analysis. So um, I just put up the tyranny of the case study versus the big picture that um, when we look and zoom in on a specific site, that can just only be telling us part of the story. And then you zoom out and think about the big picture and that reveals something different. So it's how to kind of bring these two into conversation um, together. So I was uh, the postdoc on this project um, in charge of the data collection for the Near East. And um, we actually ended up focusing really um, on the kind of Levant for our main data collection. So really kind of west of the Euphrates and then down into kind of the areas of, of modern Jordan, um, Palestine, Israel, Lebanon and Syria. Um, and so one of the key challenges in designing a kind of methodology and a database for this project was how we could bring together um, very disparate and diverging data and make it cross comparable. So in many cases, what we tried to do where there was um, existing uh, rich publication, uh, including kind of full analysis of something like minimum number of individuals, and that's a term I'll, I'll use throughout the, the talk today, um, information about the biological age and sex of the individuals, anything about the kind of um, osteology. Um, that information we try to kind of in, encode and record um, in detail in the database. And alongside that, we try to bring in um, data on uh, kind of the material culture associated with these different burial contexts. Um, and this could include both uh, remains or, or materials that had been modified by humans or made by humans, um, but also remains that had not been modified. Um, in other cases, however, it wasn't always possible to um, 
include really detailed data. Um, and the image I chose to um, kind of advertise the, the talk and this image on the, the right hand side here, um, which is a, a cairn um, in Syria where I carried out my PhD work. Um, in many cases, we're dealing with this type of um, example to, or this type of record to actually add into the database. So something like a, a looted uh, burial monument, um, often without definitive dating. So it's how to kind of bring all these levels, all these different types of information actually together um, into a coherent system so we can then um, construct some of these bigger analyses. So despite all these kind of challenges, and I've just given you a little insight into kind of many of the challenges that we faced um, carrying out this work, um, we estimated that when the project ended, um, or at least came to the end of its preliminary phase um, in 2014, um, that we'd probably managed to record, um, achieve detailed coverage for around 70% of the known and published sites um, in this Levantine area. And that was particularly relating to sites where, as I said before, we've, we've got this very robust and rich um, data set to work with in terms of the published material. So this would include uh, details about uh, the nature of the burial context, the dating of the burial context, material culture, and then kind of um, if osteological and, and bioarchaeological information wasn't available, reasons for the lack of the skeletal material, the lack of analysis. Um, and then alongside that, um, we recorded kind of minimal um, coverage where perhaps no skeletal data had been recorded, um, including a kind of summary coverage from um, journals and online databases. So something like Mega Jordan, for example, where we've got, um, we maybe had dots on a map and, and, and basic information about the different kind of um, sites we were looking at. So all of this um, in terms of the kind of overall database that we'd produced in 2014 um, corresponded to, as I was kind of hinting at before, um, a really big data project in terms of just the sheer amount of data that we'd managed to gather. So this accounted to data from about um, over a thousand sites um, over 43,000 um, individuals ranging from uh, the Neolithic through to the, the kind of Roman period um, and basically in terms of data entry, about 77,000 um, um, data entry points. And from this, we were therefore able to think about and to start thinking about some of the kind of major trends and patterns within the overall um, data in terms of particularly the visibility of the dead. And that was something we were very much focused on in this project as the, you know, the, the heading invisible dead um, might actually suggest, but also thinking about their treatment over to kind of time and space. Um, and myself and colleagues have published on this um, elsewhere, so I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail about the kind of findings from this original phase, this preliminary phase of the, of the, the project um, today. But what I did want to highlight, kind of one key um, idea that emerged from this project and in many ways was kind of expected um, is that the visibility of the dead is not even over time and space and importantly that these patterns in terms of periods when the, the dead are very visible um, in the archaeological record do not necessarily always correlate with um, periods when we have rich and robust settlement data. So there seemed to be, at least from this kind of initial preliminary phase, a kind of imbalance between um, periods when we have a lot of settlements appearing in different regions, um, as opposed to when we have kind of lots of, uh, lots of burials appearing, or at least visible um, burials. And from this, we started to think about and try and dissect why this might be, why some of these patterns might be appearing. And this graph basically um, that I've got up on the screen here just shows um, the a relative um, MNI percentage by a hundred year time block. And if anybody's got any questions about how we kind of went about producing these graphs, you can always ask me at, at the end. Um, but basically, this just shows that if you divide the kind of MNI for if any given 100 year time block um, by the total minimum number of individuals that we have for this whole region, um, it's not even over time. So we have periods in which, uh, so particularly the fourth millennium BCE, 
where it's very visible and particularly in the in the southern levant and then um, other phases where um, the dead appear to be less visible or was less dead that had been excavated and so some of the things that we started considering as a, a way of kind of explaining these uh, differences over time and space um, were obviously things like past excavation strategies so where had people been looking um, we can think about you know certain areas having been often uh, ignored or, or not paid attention to. Um, we can think about um, areas um, such as whether burials are taking place on a site or off a site. All of these might actually influence how archaeologists have been able to actually encounter um, the dead and the archaeological record. We can also think about different modes of deposition. So whether we're talking about uh, cremation or shallow burials. Um, and then one of the kind of more recent um, ideas that we've also um, started to kind of play around with is whether this also shows um, ideas of potential control being exerted um, with different individuals potentially um, dictating where and how certain uh, people that could actually be buried. Um, and that's one of the things that we started kind of to play around with in terms of our discussions. So since the kind of origins of the project and the beginnings of, of this work, um, research on this, um, this kind of subject has developed in two slightly different directions. So my colleagues at Durham University, including Dan Lawrence um, and Graham Phillip and others, have been doing some a fantastic work, really kind of building on this big picture analysis and trying to understand shifting patterns in settlement and burial and how they relate and, and the relationships between these two kind of um, uh, observations. Um, and this is just a graph that um, Dan uh, sent to me um, and I won't really say any more about that research, but it's ongoing. So uh, watch out for some exciting kind of results coming out hopefully um, in the next few years. So my research in contrast had developed in a slightly different um, direction. And what I've tried to do is actually delve deeper. Um, so take a deeper dive into the context and the data that we recorded as part of this project and to think about kind of several um, key themes. Um, and those themes are, are kind of the, the ideas that I really want to focus on today. Um, so these include relationships between human bodies within a, a burial context, the manipulation and treatment of the human body itself, and finally, a, a subject that I won't go into a lot of detail about today, I'll just hopefully touch upon at the end, um, the relationships between human bodies and non-human agents within uh, mortuary contexts. So by its very nature, um, this, uh, this research involved the kind of um, enhancement and collation and analysis of additional uh, data, and that's a, an ongoing process. I'm working through all the data um, at the moment. And so although we, I also kind of added uh, new information about new burials as they've been published since 2014 uh, to the database, a lot of it involved actually just adding further records to enhance the basic data we already had uh, within that kind of data set. Um, but in many ways, I feel like I've only just scratched the surface of this. Um, and there's many different ways in which um, these data could be considered and analysed. And so I'd love to hear from you at the end about you know, any ideas or, or things that you think um, would be really interesting to kind of explore. Um, so to what I want to do today is zoom in on the Bronze Age Levant, as I kind of suggested in my title um, of this talk, and, and pick up on these two themes, the, the relationships between human bodies and the manipulation and treatment of the human body in the, the burial context itself. So to start, uh, perhaps one of the most obvious variations to consider um, in the way in which the human corpse is being treated and manipulated in death um, is the numbers of dead actually involved in any given burial context. And this can range from a, a single corpse, um, such as in uh, many of the EB4 um, tombs at Jericho, um, and I've just put an image up there on the, the top right hand side of some of the EB4 tombs, to EB4 tombs um, from Jericho, and um, to perhaps a couple of individuals um, in the case of uh, Tawala Sharki, also dated to the EB4, which is up on the, the left hand side um, here through to potentially hundreds of individuals in some of these multiple collective tombs um, in the case of the example from uh, Jericho there in the bottom um, dated to the EB1. And it obviously goes without saying 
that these variations can significantly impact the overall excavated burial population from any given site, region or chronological period. And one of the most obvious ways you can kind of think about that is just comparing the number of burial monuments we have for any given period with the minimum number of individuals. And just to show you one example of this, um, what we have here is a plot that we produced of uh, burial uh, features, so definite MNBF means minimum number of burial features, um, from this EV4, so from about 2500 to about 2000 BCE um, period. So all of those are kind of plotted out in um, little black uh, dots with the uh, minimum number of individual values and um, plotted over the top of that. And what you can obviously see is, as I was hinting at before, we have sites where we simply don't have information about the skeletal material. But still, just looking at this as kind of an overall uh, map plotted out, you'd see this period as a kind of fluorescence of uh, burial activity um, a real kind of period where there seems to be a peak of activity. But when you then compare, compare that with uh, the MNI record for that period, you can see actually this is a period, although we have a lot of burials, uh, burial monuments, we don't necessarily have the, the skeletal remains or the, the individuals being buried. Um, appearing very visibly within the archaeological record. And this is obviously due um, to the fact we've got kind of, in some cases, we've got the use or the predominant use of kind of single um, single burial uh, contexts that are being then excavated um, by archaeologists. So how can we further think about this? So scholars such as Rafi Greenberg, uh, in his recent uh, book on the archaeology of the Bronze Age Levant, um, has suggested that particularly um, in terms of investment, the amount of labour involved in the construction and elaboration of um, tombs containing a single individual, as opposed to tombs that contain um, multiple individuals, is a, a significant investment. And his work also has started to highlight um, some of the different levels of visibility um, in terms of subterranean tombs versus above ground tombs, as well as the interplay between individualizing tombs and collective tombs. And here we can think about, you know, the difference between something like shaft tombs or um, dolmens, uh, I've got just a, an image of a dolmen from Jordan um, up on this slide here. Now, in terms of thinking about subterranean and above ground, we can obviously bring in uh, topographical or geomorphological limitations. However, um, there are sites that move us beyond those kind of simple um, explanations for the presence and absence of individual and multiple burials, but also for above ground and subterranean structures. And here we can think of sites where we have both. So for example, um, at early Bronze Age Baba Dra, we have the shaft tombs dating to the EB1A, um, and then we have above ground tombs that date to EB23. So we've got kind of shared practices um, or, or different practices going on at different times, but which push against this idea that it's, it's simply down to kind of ge geomorphology. Moreover, what I would suggest is that um, whether subterranean or above ground, there are different opportunities afforded by the burial of a single individual uh, within a single tomb, as opposed to the burial of multiple individuals um, within a single tomb. And whether these are part of a, a larger cemetery or not, there's something different there. And there's a choice being actually made there in terms of um, whether to deposit people together or not. So I want to delve further into this subject and really zoom in on two main periods where we see um, and we can understand there to be a kind of popularity in terms of the use of multiple collective tombs. And the two periods I want to look at are the early Bronze Age one, so the, the kind of fourth millennium, mid um, to late fourth millennium BCE, and then the Middle Bronze Age, and so the second uh, millennium. Um, and one thing worth highlighting um, the kind of outset is when we're talking about these early Bronze Age I burials in the Levant, we're really talking about the central and the southern Levant. And I'll, I'll hint towards and I'll, I'll kind of um, show you in a minute um, our evidence for burial practices from this period in the northern Levant are extremely limited in terms of the evidence that we actually have. <clears throat> 
So to start with um, EB, EB1, um, and to think about some of the kind of striking elements from this period. And so here I've just plotted out, um, represented by little black um, circles, um, sites that we know have multiple collective tombs that we can definitively date to the early Bronze Age one. So there are others that I could actually plot out here that where the dating is, is less certain. And I should also mention that these only include tombs uh, where we have skeletal material associated. So in other cases, we might be able to suggest based on the form of the tomb that they seem they would seem to be a multiple collective tomb. Um, but I've chosen just for this, the purposes of uh, this talk today to just plot out those where we definitely have skeletal material um, and we also have uh, robust dating uh, dating evidence. So one of the most kind of striking elements of tombs from this period is the sheer variability in the numbers that are actually deposited within these tombs. And I just wanted to give you a couple of examples to show you that diversity. So if we think about somewhere like the early Bronze Age 1 to 2 tomb at Enhaklil, and this is represented uh, by the little red dot here, um, this uh, site was uh, recently estimated to contain a minimum number of individuals, uh, uh, of, of 19 minimum number of individuals by Yossi Nagar. Similarly, we can think about uh, the site of Babadra and the EB1A tombs um, from that site, where it's been estimated that the average number of burials is around 19.7 um, individuals per shaft tomb. And this is based on work that has been carried out by Ortner and Froelich, but also Thomas Schau, um, and just a, an image, a table from his uh, 2009 um, publication here. So in contrast to that, at the other end of the, the spectrum, we have tombs that contain hundreds or 100 plus um, individuals. Um, and this includes um, somewhere like Tel Asur, where we've got um, K562 with 137 individuals. And then we can also think about uh, Jericho, that, as I've already mentioned, some of the proto-urban or um, EB1 uh, through to EB3 tombs. Um, at this site, um, particularly K, tomb K2, uh, which is thought to have contained over 300 um, individuals. Now, some of these variations in numbers could in part be explained by the longevity of use of some of these tombs. So if we think about Jericho again, um, a tomb like Tomb A, for example, which has been estimated to have a, an MNI of up to 500 individuals and was first excavated by Garstang in the 1930s. Um, this is thought to have been used throughout EB1 through to EB3. So one of the factors we could be dealing with is obviously the fact that these, these tombs are potentially used over long periods of time. So this might be influencing the overall number of individuals were, that have been excavated um, from these contexts. A complicating factor is here, however, that we often can't assign these burial remains to um, discrete phases within these tombs. Although it has been argued that based on the fact that um, in general our evidence for EB2 and 3, so um, third millennium BCE burials um, in the Southern Levant is concentrated just on a couple of sites, um, that actually this is a period where we seem to be missing the dead in many ways and various scholars have written about this, people like David Alam, um, and suggested that actually in terms of these tombs that are used throughout EB1 to EB3, um, we actually may be the majority of individuals are perhaps dating to this earlier phase, this EB1 fourth millennium phase. So given that and acknowledging those complications, um, I would suggest that the continued use and reuse of EB1 tombs cannot be the sole explanatory factor for these variations. We have to consider uh, other kind of variations. So by way of contrast, it's just worth briefly kind of moving to the Northern Levant um, and thinking about uh, how we see these practices and interpretations playing out in this area. Um, and as many scholars have suggested, one of the really intriguing elements about the Northern Levant um, during this fourth millennium BCE period is the overall paucity of burials. Um, and uh, perhaps beyond sites like uh, the Tel Majnuna, um, this mound uh, that's outside of the site of Tel Brak, where we have these mass 
um, collective burials. Um, there is very little data, there is very few burials to go around dating to this period. And it's not really until the third millennium BCE that kind of visible burial practice seemed to really re-emerge um, in this region. And even once we're into this period, um, in terms of um, the kind of numbers of individuals being interred within some of these collective and multiple burials, um, in comparison to the Southern Levant at least, we're dealing with several or tens of individuals rather than kind of hundreds. So just to give you kind of one example here, um, tomb, Jirab, uh, tomb 302 from Jarablus Tatani um, is thought to potentially have contained around 20 individuals, while tomb 1518 at the same site is thought to have contained around um, five individuals. So although various variations kind of exist, there doesn't seem in either the fourth or the third millennium BCE appear to be a kind of tradition akin to that of the collective tombs that we've just been discussing in relation to um, the early Bronze Age, the EB1 in the Southern Levant. So I want to stay on this theme of numbers um, here and move into the second millennium BCE to think about the similarities and differences that we're seeing um, across this region during this period. Um, and one of the things that has been suggested is that it's not really until we move into the kind of latter half um, of the Middle Bronze Age, so really the MB2 period, um, that we see the significant use and popularity of multiple or collective burials again. Um, one of the complicating factors again here is that um, with, we don't always have that chronological resolution for all of the tombs that we've recorded as part of the Invisible Dead project, or even that I've been working with more recently. So some of them, many of them are actually just assigned a Middle Bronze Age date rather than being assigned to MB1 versus MB2. So that kind of blurs this, this overall picture a little. Some scholars, um, such as Jill Baker, for example, have suggested that when we see this uh, uh, reuse or this um, increasing popularity of Middle Bronze Age collective teams in, in uh, this kind of second millennium BCE period, and um, that this is a kind of con continuation or a re-emergence of the collective traditions um, that were in operation during the third millennium BCE. Other scholars have kind of pushed back against that and said, due to this gap, this period during EB4 and MB1, uh, when we do seem to see a lot of single, um, single inhumations, um, that actually uh, this seems to be during the MB and LB, a kind of complete reinvention and reorientation um, of burial practices. And this is perhaps taking inspiration um, from wider kind of traditions and trends within Syria Mesopotamia. But what I want to really kind of focus on um, just for a moment is the, the differences in the numbers of dead that are being interred within these Middle Bronze Age tombs and likely Middle Bronze Age II um, tombs. So to give you again a couple of examples, um, Melissa Craddock has carried out an excellent analysis at the, the site of Megiddo um, demonstrating that the large majority of the population of that site were interred in primary tombs um, and in individual um, burials. We do, however, from that site um, have uh, the existence of multiple tombs like tomb uh, 100, which is potentially um, thought to have housed several dozen individuals. And um, again, along with the jar and pit burials in this area, uh, in this area around tomb 100, has been interpreted by Craddock to represent the burial of several generations of residents um, from this, this courtyard house where these, these tombs are located. Um, at Jericho, again, um, and I'm using Jericho a lot, um, we could say it was a Tyrannus case study, um, but it's a very good example to kind of discuss and, and think through some of these ideas that I'm mentioning. Um, but at this site, what we have is perhaps around 20 burials um, in the majority of the, um, the Middle Bronze Age tombs. <clears throat> and just to put that in contrast with the early Bronze Age examples, Kenyon, when she was originally writing about these numbers, suggested that and um, the EB1 tombs held 75 individuals at a very minimum. And as we've already seen, many of them um, contain a much, much larger number 
Um, and similar patterns can also be seen at a site like Middle Bronze Age Original Zion, uh, when numbers would appear to kind of vary between about a dozen to several dozen individuals deposited within multiple phases within these tombs. Um, if we move further north again and think about the northern Levant, um, here we're perhaps dealing with a, a little bit more variation in numbers. Um, but one of the challenges again here is we often um, lack robust uh, minimum number of individuals um, information. Um, so this particularly applies to sites like Rashama Ugrit, um, where actually that information we just simply don't have access to. At other sites, um, we can think about uh, Katna, the Royal Hypogeum at Katna, where it's been uh, suggested by Peter Feltzner and colleagues that we might have between 20 and 24 individuals. And then a site like Ebler, and um, here I'm thinking of the Middle Bronze Age um, P8. 680 tomb um, published by Mogliezza and Polcaro, uh, where we potentially have about 56 um, individuals. So there is obviously a little bit more air variation here. And I should mention that there are exceptions to this kind of um, these more limited uh, numbers um, in terms of tombs from both the northern and southern Levant. And here we can mention something like tomb 62 from Pella, uh, which has been published by Stephen Burke and tomb seven at Katna. And particularly with that latter example, one of the things we can think about is whether the extent to which those tombs would have been periodically cleared out. So that's obviously something we need to kind of take into account. So how do all these, how can we interpret all these patterns and these variations? And it's here I want to kind of turn um, to, to the second part and finish off the, the paper by thinking about the second major theme that I was talking about, the manipulation and the treatment of the human body. Um, and here we can particularly think about the differences between burial contexts where we have evidence for articulated, um, partially articulated or disarticulated human remains and all the variations in between. Now, the study of these practices, um, often falling under the general heading of secondary burial practices, has become particularly prolific in recent um, decades. Um, and I've just put up a, a few examples of the um, articles that have been published, ranging in time uh, really from the, the kind of Calcolithic through to the Iron Age. Um, and many of these discussions often draw their inspiration from early 20th century research um, on kind of rites of passage and secondary burial and um, published by scholars such as Robert Hertz and Arnold van Gennep. So I want to kind of acknowledge that um, huge and influential body of research that has been carried out um, and is covered by these broad categories. But what I want to kind of dissect is that this broad term, this, this use of this secondary burial term, often actually encapsulates a variety of behaviours and types of evidence. And it's that what I that's that kind of aspect that I would just want to shine a little light on um, for the, the kind of rest of this talk. So one of the most significant differences between the range of burial practices and processes that often fall under this heading of secondary burials is the degree to which the human body itself is fragmented and manipulated. And in many cases, we can kind of put these uh, along a spectrum. Um, or a continuum of interactions from single burials where there is no evidence for any post-mortem treatment uh, through to kind of partially articulated burials where um, it seems there's been some kind of attention paid to the uh, maintenance of the integrity of the corpse through to multiple disarticulated burials where there seems to have been an attempt to deliberately remove, replace or interact with the fragmented corpse itself. Um, and one of the, the ways in which we can kind of uh, explore this or one of the kind of data points we can use as a proxy that we recorded as part of this project and I've worked on since is by looking at the change and the distribution of the disarticulated um, dead to the, the dead that have kind of decayed and then been broken up to the, into their constituent parts um, and their distribution over time. And this is just what I'm kind of showing you here on this graph. And it's a simple plot out of the numbers of um, individuals that we have that appear to be disarticulated in the archeological record. Um, and as you can see, this period that I'm talking about, this EB1 um, period, um, is represented by a kind of peak of disarticulated remains that we see in the archaeological record. 
And we can kind of further delve into that um, by thinking and using plots to think about how this um, correlates with the overall um, MNI of any given time period or any given kind of hundred year time block. Um, and think about um, not just the burial numbers, but the kind of percentages that we're dealing with. And again, even here, this EB1 kind of period um, appears as a, a kind of peak in activity. I'll just mention, I won't go into any detail, but again, you can ask me at the end if you're interested. Um, this comes back to this idea of the Tyrannus case study, because Biblos is a site that tends to throw a lot of the plots off because uh, we have a lot of burials from that site over 1,400, but we don't actually have a lot of robust data, despite the amazing work that's been done by Gassia Artan um, publishing this material. Um, there's just not a lot of data to work from, so that can often throw off the kind of plots that we're producing as part of this. But what I really want to kind of focus on um, is that one of the striking features of many of the kind of EBA collective tombs that I've already discussed in terms of the burial numbers is the, the kind of sheer evidence that we have for the deliberate and careful arrangement of body parts in clusters or burial zones. And this is a practice that's not always visible in the later Middle Bronze Age tombs. So what we seem to have in a lot of these EB1 tombs is the careful arrangement of the dead and the constituent body parts um, following either full or partial decomposition and disarticulation. And I've just literally put up a, a couple of examples on this slide here. Um, again, thinking about Jericho, but also Babadra, um, another site where we have clear evidence for this. Um, and also um, other examples such as a, a rock cut tomb dated for the EB1B from um, Shibley up there on the, the top left hand side here. Um, and here we appear to have certain body parts being preferentially treated, um, in particular things like crania and femurs, um, in the case of um, Shibley. And I just also wanted to point to a recent article that's been published by Evans, Faulkner and Asmussen in 2022. Um, which actually suggests that um, the material from tomb A61 at Jericho um, seems to point towards a practice of either the removal or targeted burning of long bones, as well as potentially the deliberate creation of cranial material. So we've got a lot of interaction going on uh, with individual body parts here. And there are numerous other examples that we could actually add to this list. So there's been lots of interpretations about how we kind of uh, treat the, the use of collective tombs and the, the kind of popularity of collective tombs. And these have ranged from ideas of kind of ancestors to heterarchy. Um, but other scholars have started to kind of push towards this idea of, of whether these practices can be used to un better understand um, past personhood and what it means to be human. And here I'm particularly thinking of the work by Meredith Chesson. Now, one of the, the kind of key works to explore these ideas um, were produced by, not focused on the, the Middle East um, or the Levant region, um, but were published um, by somebody called Chris Fowler back in 2005 um, in his volume on the archaeology of personhood. And he basically problematized this concept of individuality and indivisibility of the human body as a natural feature of being human and instead suggested that the ways in which the body and people are configured and conceptualized are historically contingent so it varies over time and space um, and drawing upon anthropological thought and ethnographic examples um, he raised this idea of relational personhood or individual um, personhood. And I haven't got time to go into all of the kind of details about these theories today. Um, but what I kind of wanted to raise um, is one of the biggest critiques of this 2005 work um, was the fact that, yes, he used ethnographic models, but for our, our purposes of our discussions today, that he kind of um, opposed um, individual and individual. Um, so individual was this idea that um, a kind of oppositional alternative whereby the individual could be, or the person, the individual rather, could be um, multi-authored and basically composed as a, a kind of um, a composite of relations, substances and actions of others. 
Um, and there was various ideas of partability and permeability that were kind of suggested in relation to this. But the biggest critique was this idea that individual individual were kind of on oppositional ends. And this has been more recently addressed in his kind of uh, revised work on this subject, where he's argued that all persons are shaped by the, the relationships between people and objects. Um, and uh, that a way of plotting this out is kind of um, looking at this in relation to the right hand side model, uh, where the individual and individual are not necessarily opposed, but are, are merely different ways of representing, bringing together or assembling uh, the different relations that form a person. So I want to kind of think of those ideas and keep them in mind as we just return to the evidence that we've been discussing and think a bit more about how personhood might be conveyed in death during this early Bronze Age period. So in his recent uh, volume on the Bronze Age Levant, Greenberg characterises EB1A settlement in particular as, and I quote, sprawling villages only loosely tethered to specific locations. And it's this idea of kind of loose uh, spatial tethering that I just want to kind of mention. Um, and it might seem a bit of a, a kind of a shift to go from talking about the burial evidence to the settlement evidence, but I then want to kind of bring them back into conversation as, as we move to the end of the talk today. So one of the things that has been noted about um, the distribution of EB1A and EB1 burials, and I've already talked about this at the beginning of the talk, is particularly in the Southern Levant, they are unevenly spread. And we don't necessarily have a situation whereby we have burials and then settlement that goes along with those burials. So here we can think about uh, Babadra. For the EB1A period, there's no clear evidence of a permanent settlement activity associated with the EB1A burials. Um, and what's been suggested by many scholars, including Thomas Schaub, as well as by uh, more recent isotopic analysis on the third millennium BCE burials from Babadra, um, is that people might be moving with the dead and bringing them to these burial locales and depositing them within tombs from settlements elsewhere. Um, this theme of kind of movement and mobility has also been brought up in relation to the uh, settlement evidence more generally dating to this period. And so Nicole and Bremer in their study of the Lejar um, have suggested or argued for the possibility of residential mobility during this EB1 period and particularly during the EB1A um, with the idea that populations could come together at, at different levels of social grouping. So households, extended households and lineages, or then a kind of entire group, large sized agglomeration. Um, and I suggested, and my, um, alongside Graham Phillips, suggested similar ideas for the Homs Basel or the, the War in Syria, as well as for areas in northern Jordan. Now, obviously, one of the challenges here is uh, com um, contemporaneity. Were all these sites being used at the same time? Um, but I think this idea of multi-sited communities and, and residential mobility um, allows us to look at this period in a, in a slightly different way and also allows us to perhaps rethink about uh, the burials that we've just been discussing. So what I would like to suggest here is that if during this EB1 period and we can debate whether this is just an EB1 uh, aspect or continues into the EB1B, I would argue it does. Um, if we argue that during this period, um, at least within certain areas of perhaps the central and southern Levant, we're dealing with a settlement system and a society and a societal structure that could fission and fragment and then coalesce and reform at different kind of sizes, um, different intensities, then I would argue that the, the very concept of the person also had the potential to be broken down and fragmented and reconstituted. And so we can kind of think about the possibility that the, the foundational building blocks of society or you know, your starting bit of Lego um, was not necessarily a discrete and bounded individual. And instead, like society itself, the body may have been considered as having the potential to also be an unbounded entity formed and constituted by relations with other people and objects, and thus partable and divisible. 
So within such a worldview and drawing upon uh, such bodily frameworks, I would argue that the removal and the continued interaction with particular body parts may have been a really integral part of the mortuary process and an integral way of actually dealing with the dead. Now, this is not to suggest that individuals didn't exist within EB1, um, but rather that um, different kind of scales and relationality and thus types of person could be brought to the fore and kind of highlighted during these um, burial practices. And I would argue that this helps us kind of better understand the variation in burial numbers seen in EB1 tombs from tens of individuals to hundreds of individuals, but also the variety of pack practices, both fragmented and unfragmented forms in which we find the dead during this period. So to finish this talk, then, I just wanted to kind of mention uh, where this leaves us in relation to the second millennium BCE, the Middle Bronze Age. Um, and again, we do see this little kind of peak um, in terms of the disarticulated dead during the, the second millennium BCE, during this Middle Bronze Age period. Um, and particularly, we can even identify, at least in just the kind of plots of the, the sheer number of individuals, um, a kind of little peak during this MB2 period, so from about 1800 BCE. And other um, scholars have argued, like Melissa Craddock, have suggested that the commingled remains of individualized bodies and objects found in reused burial spaces at sites like Megiddo was a kind of culmination of a ritual pro ritualized process of fragmentation during this Middle Bronze Age. Um, and we can think about that, that the fact that that was reserved for only a small proportion of the overall deceased population with specific individuals actually being selected uh, for this retreatment. So I think um, a lot of these ideas and, and Melissa Craddock's reading of this around commemoration and household are, are really astute. Um, but I wonder, in contrast to the early Bronze Age examples, whether actually the process of fragmentation itself was a pivotal part of the practice or not, especially if we think about perhaps um, other approaches that would uh, perhaps stress ideas of kind of temporality or lengthened interactions with the, the dead. So it's not to suggest that relational personhood didn't exist in the Middle Bronze Age, but rather that a different type of relational personhood was being expressed in the burial record at this period. And here, I just want to end really by kind of um, suggesting that we can actually see this by taking a closer look at the descriptions and the plans of the Middle Bronze Age uh, burials, um, and particularly thinking about them in comparison to the early Bronze Age ones that I've really been focused on today. And so if we just um, very uh, quickly think about uh, the different uh, terms that have been used to actually describe the ways in which these uh, commingled remains are being treated, rather than having uh, terms such as structured or carefully placed um, being used to de describe some of these tombs, we've got tombs like uh, terms such as disordered or cast aside, mounded, heaps actually being used in reference to this, um, this disarticulated material that is found. And also what we, we seem to see is the presence of both articulated, partially articulated and disarticulated material found within these Middle Bronze Age tombs. And I just wanted to highlight some um, uh, research that's been carried out by Clatter and Levy, and this is from a 2015 published article, um, which actually looked at the, the, the potential existence of simultaneous burials in a lot of these Middle Bronze Age collective tombs. Um, which really, I would argue, um, puts a kind of focus or a greater attention on the integrity of the human corpse and that fragmentation wasn't kind of really a, a kind of integral part of this. So based on the set of brief examples I've kind of discussed here, I would suggest that there's evidence, at least in some cases, to suggest that fragmentation in the Middle Bronze Age and Late Bronze Age um, was a, merely a byproduct of the lengthened engagement with the dead and not necessarily a deliberate and intentional transformation in contrast um, to the early Bronze Age tombs that we were talking about before. And that's not to suggest that the commingling of bodies into an ancestral community was not important, but rather that the commingling of fragmented or composite bodies was not the aim or the primary aim of these practices.
And with all these overall patterns um, and evidence in mind, I would argue that the foundational social units, um, or at least the ways in which these were kind of conceptualized, differed across space and time in the ancient Levant. And when we see the re-emergence of multiple successive tombs as a kind of popular mode of burial in the second millennium BCE period, things have changed. Concepts of personhood have potentially changed. And also the landscape of power and status have changed. And it's through a lens of familial and perhaps generational ownership and authority that such tombs should be viewed and interpreted. And again, this is not to suggest that there was no interplay between different ideas of personhood during the second millennium BCE. Um, rather, I would argue that through the burial record, we see this kind of changing shift in the ways in which personhood uh, were conceptualized and also this kind of ongoing um, negotiation of relationality. So where do we go from here and what does the, the kind of uh, the project have um, in its kind of future. So I've just showed you a very small fragment um, of what really using kind of uh, both a macro and micro scale um, alongside a kind of detailed analysis of a case study, the, the kind of um, the data that can be produced and the interpretations that can be produced on that. Um, and there are clearly a huge range of ways in which we could um, think about the ways in which the human body was treated in death. And I've particularly focused on disarticulated bodies today, um, but one of the um, other kind of patterns I've been looking at and shifts over time and space is changing in changes of burial positioning over time. So in terms of the articulated dead, how are they positioned in the grave? Are they flexed? Are they extended? Are they tightly flexed? Um, are they even in um, more atypical positions? Um, and just a couple of examples are provided at the bottom of the slide of, of a positioning that is perhaps more atypical in terms of what we're actually seeing. So I would argue that all these approaches um, allow us to potentially shed light on how people in the past conceived of themselves, um, but also um, how kind of the, the, the living interacted with human bodies. Um, and also, obviously, one addition to kind of add to this is how um, human bodies are being used and interacted with alongside kind of non-human agents or objects, material culture within the burial context. So ultimately, I think what this research is starting to show is despite some of these broad trends and patterns, the diversity of nuances um, in the burial record shouldn't be ignored. So um, by using this term secondary burial, actually that's hiding a lot of variability and we actually have to drill down and kind of look at the real messiness, look at the real complexity there in order to better understand um, and better think through the different ways in which the people in the past dealt with both the living and the dead. Um, and I will leave it there for today, but thank you so much um, for listening um, and allowing me to talk about one of my favourite subjects in the world. Um, and um, just a few kind of acknowledgements and thanks again to, to Marco for inviting me to talk today. And thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you, thank very, you much, very much, uh, Jenny, Jenny, for this, for this uh, 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 brilliant, brilliant and fascinating talk. Absolutely, it's been it's been pleasure to 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 listen to it actually it's it's uh, uh, for me it's been actually absolutely illuminating because this is kind of of, of research that i'm not used to to you know to, to focus on but it's uh, uh actually was was really as i said i was really uh fascinated by the the, the results that you obtained with the different projects that you are basing on for for this this analysis um, so I would I would uh, immediately ask the people to the particip participants if they if anyone has any, any any question for 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 Jenny or I think so there is a first one uh, Alia. Uh, good evening, professors. Uh, I really wanted to ask uh, ask about the last burial that we talked about the one that has a large number of skeletons. So this is was it was a kind of a family. Uh, uh like members they used to like bury them there or it's the number of the uh, like like uh, the tribe uh, people uh, some kind of ritual like the uh, the tribe uh, members they used to bury them there so uh, <laughs> that's it thank you thank you so much for the question um 
So yeah, I think one of the differences that we're actually seeing between these um, multiple collective tombs um, over these different periods that I've been looking at from the kind of early Bronze Age through to the Middle Bronze Age is, um, as you've kind of hinted at, the, the numbers of individuals going in and whether those are, whether they can be seen as families or not. So um, in terms of the, the Middle Bronze Age tombs, um, one of the things that has been argued about those is that they do seem to represent um, family tombs in some way or potentially even a con constructed family that you might even have individuals um, who are not all part of a kind of biological relationship that who are being added to these tombs selected because they are important people within the society um, and being through this kind of um, deposition and in a kind of collective burial being transformed into ancestors through the, the very fact that they're kind of being brought together. Um, in the case of the early Bronze Age burials, I don't think that's what ha is happening necessarily. And I don't think we're necessarily talking about families. Um, I think we could be uh, talking about perhaps uh, smaller social groupings in some cases where we've got smaller numbers. But in other cases, I think we're talking about um, whole communities perhaps burying their dead in some of these tombs and that's where we can get into the idea of, of the dead actually perhaps bringing the human remains to some of these tombs from settlements elsewhere um, moving uh, their dead so I think there's a lot of different uh, practices that are going on during these kind of different periods that has been hidden by the fact that these are often just kind of treated all as these are collective tombs and we kind of put them in a single category over here and we don't really kind of uh, delve down into the, the details about them to understand some of the differences um, that we can actually see in the archaeological record. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So other, other questions? I forgot, by the way, to, to, to stop the record, but we can... Uh... And I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, perhaps just so <laughs> um, people can. Yeah, okay. Um, so 